Well, Jill, thank you so much for helping me with my project. I was wondering if you could say a few words about yourself. Oh, hi, Nathan. I'm Jill Sweeney, and I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I manage uh, a team of technical content information developers that create content for our compute and uh, HPC customers, high performance computing that help them set up configuration and uh, troubleshooting for our products. I am a native of Scotland and I live in Houston, Texas. Wow. Uh, well, first of all, I've actually been to Scotland a few months ago and I interviewed some people there too. So that was kind of neat. Well, the accent was probably a little different. Uh, yes, that's true. Of course, I think they were visiting from England. So when a true Scottish oh, accent. Oh yeah, exactly. Anyway. It wouldn't have been. Um, I remember HP having a advertisement about sending uh, a set of computers to the International Space Station. Um, we we do, and ironically, that is that support work is on my team. So um, the spaceborne computer is a hardened, defense-hardened uh, supercomputer that went with the International Space uh, Station, and they're now working on the second generation of that. So I have a person that supports that project um, that creates content, and it creates some challenges because uh, there's general industry standards and then there's NASA standards. So uh, it makes it a little more complex than what we're used to. But there are no IT engineers in space, so the astronauts have to be able to manage anything that the supercomputer needs itself. Well, that's uh, pretty awesome. So you're no stranger to the space program. Well, I I live in Houston, so um, the first place I visited was uh, the space station, uh, the, uh, the space center. However, um, with vis frequent visitors, we went there a lot. And I actually went back last year after the first time in maybe 10 years um, with my parents, um, just kind of, because we heard you could go in and see what mission control looked like. They kind of opened it up as it was when Houston was talking to uh, the rest of the control towers. That's uh, pretty awesome. I know it's always nice to have visitors and get to see your own place through new eyes from time to time. But you maybe don't want to go like, every month or twice a year. <laughs> it's a lot of walking. That's true. Uh, so did you know that we were planning to send people back to the moon in 2024? Um, I hadn't seen that specifically, but I had uh, attended at a women's conference, a SpaceX discussion on opening up more commercial space power. So uh, I didn't know if that was to the moon or specifically, you know, to Mars. They weren't very specific in where the destination was, just that they wanted to open up commercial space travel. Yeah, uh, that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, talking about SpaceX, uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, they're actually launching astronauts for the first time to the International Space Station. I did not know that. That I'll have to follow that. That sounds very interesting. It'll be the first time that we're launching astronauts from the US since the retirement of the space shuttle in 2011. Wow. And um, also as a commercial vehicle that you and I could potentially buy a ticket on at some point. Oh, goodness. That's cool. So where are they launching from? Uh, Florida. Um, okay. The Kennedy Space Center. Uh, th from, the same, um, from the same launch pad that the um, you know, Apollo 11 was launched from that the shuttle launched from, and, and now they've uh, converted it to launch SpaceX rockets. Oh, wow, because um, the presentation that I saw was about a year ago, and they were talking about how they deployed some of their commercial satellites, and um, not all of them successfully. So it was interesting to kind of hear that background. So that's amazing. That would be such a milestone. It is, and I know that, um, you know, women inside of aerospace and inside of tech in general uh, has been always kind of like an underrepresented group. And um, you talked about going to the SpaceX conference, I think. Um, one of the key things is actually landing a woman on the moon for the first time in 2024. And I was wondering um, what you thought about that. I think that's an awesome idea. Um, women are and minorities are underrepresented in the um, 
in many technical fields. And part of that's from a visibility standpoint of knowing what the careers are and what the choices are early on as, you know, late elementary school to middle school. Um, there's just, you just don't see visible role models. So I think having a woman in that program would absolutely open up the view. Uh, we've had um, Sally Ride, Krista McAuliffe, you know, visible women, and, and then many more astronauts since then um, that have been in the space program. But I haven't seen it through the commercial space industry. In fact, the reason I went to the, uh, so I was at um, Grace Hopper uh, Computing, and, you know, Admiral Grace Hopper was one of the first uh, computer sciences and really someone that drove it for women through the military. But I went to that th for two reasons. One, I'm a big fan of industries that get disrupted and this is a huge one. But I'm also interested in strong women leaders and what the leader had done just really appealed to me. But I had no idea. And uh, as I saw her slides, yes, she was like the only woman in most of the pictures. But I feel like if we do something like that, it's those big milestones that will attract, you know, more young people to go into those career programs. Yes, um, and Grace Hopper, uh, she's the one that's, uh, that quote is quoted as saying, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yes, absolutely. We love that one. I think everyone loves that excuse and, and uh, little quote. Yeah, I think uh, finding out somebody to approve your project is always an excuse maybe not to do the project. And that's like, you have no excuses. Just go do it. If it that's great. Um, well, you know, SpaceX is actually ran uh, by a woman. Um, Gwen uh, Shotwell is the president of SpaceX, and she runs their day-to-day -day operations and everything. Oh, and cool. She likes to talk about the, the reason she got into engineering was she, when she was in, I think, middle school, she had a, a woman engineer visit her school. And uh, that really inspired her. So it's, uh, you're right, so important to be able to see role models. If all you see are white male engineers and astronauts, it's not that, uh, you know, other people wouldn't want to be that, but it's just harder to imagine themselves as that. And it's kind of important to have role yeah. models getting out there. Absolutely. And it's not just women, it's minorities too. I mean, anyone who's watched Hidden Figures can see how many ob obstacles they, um, you know, encountered and just the absolute lack of knowledge from the male engineers that that was anything wrong with that model. Um, that was just definitely a challenge. Then you lay our, in all the societal pressures and norms and cultural behaviors, then it becomes very difficult to break out of any of that. Yeah, it, it definitely requires us to make a conscious choice to change it if we want to see it change. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so what do you think about uh, space exploration and us going back to the moon? Do you see that as, I mean, kind of give you the range of responses. I've kind of received some see it as uh, being kind of foundational to the future of humanity and other people see it as uh, maybe misplaced priorities. And I was just wondering kind of uh, what your thoughts were. Well, you know what, pre-pandemic, I would have say that it is foundational to the future of humanity because we have to keep pushing the boundaries. We have to explore what's next. And I don't think we should ever be constrained by the boundaries that are defined for us, which is the world that we live in today. But in the middle of, and I can't say post-pandemic yet, we've got some very real needs here at home and abroad where people don't have basic needs. And I don't think you can mortgage those for the future. And we have to take care of some of that. So I now think it's uh, absolutely shoot for the moon again. But I also think that we need to do it in a manner that, you know, can bring more people along. If we can make this an initiative where the world can benefit in that prosperity because what do you gain from going to the me the moon other than bragging rights and be the technological first does that drive in more uh, funding and research grants and can those be trickled down to those who need them and truly this the pandemic made me think of this i yeah, know that's that's true i mean i think a lot of us thought maybe other people's uh, freedom of speech and healthcare were sort of nice to have, but, and would not impact us directly. But I think we're seeing, you know, if there was a certain dentist in Wuhan, China that had the freedom to speak out, 
you know, maybe that would have changed things. And then, you know, healthcare in Asia and Africa and Latin America, uh, those could as easily be a source of the next pandemic. And, you know, if we're able to catch it early and isolate it, that affects us yeah, directly. Exactly. Um, what do you think would have to change to address those things? Oh, this is a hard one. Um, I think uh, encouraging uh, education that helps uh, educate about the basic needs, uh, get more people educated so that they can take on jobs that can support them. I think there's some governmental uh, and kind of NGO type activity that needs to support the ecosystem. So I've been involved in a project um, with a university as kind of an extra project in my job um, because my boss is a Purdue alumni and she's the Purdue executive sponsor and they were managing a program for uh, uh, trying to, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of it is, it's uh, the World Economic Forum had a mandate uh, to solve world hunger by 2050 because there had been projections that it was going to be a world food crisis by the year of 2050. So Purdue was looking for ways to increase yield outside the U.S., um, impact agricultural. So as we looked at doing a lot of that, we found that there was some basic things not being done and you needed to create an infrastructure to support. Um, how do you track the food sales? How do you get the right fertilizer? So there was many infrastructure missing in these key areas, you know, to be able to support them. They didn't have water. Um, you know, there was a tremendous trek to get water every day. So addressing some of those pieces needs a fundamental change in the, in, in the country um, or the region to be able to do that. And then I also feel like there needs to be more awareness. Um, what are the world priorities? Do the world leaders get together and decide what are our top priorities? Um, if everyone gets together and does space travel in a non-siloed manner, unlike why we did it the last time to beat another country because we we're in uh, a type of, you know, uh, well, how are we going to say that diplomatic situation? I don't really want to say war, but um, we wanted to beat the other guy. So there has to be more of a humanistic point of view and for the, for the greater good. And I just, I feel stronger about this now because of the pandemic. All these siloed approaches don't help. The countries who have need to give, need to help the ones that have not, but they also need to help them. That's not a socialistic viewpoint, but it's to help them build the capabilities that they need so they can do for themselves in the future. So it's a hand up, not a hand out kind of thing. I sound like some government person, <laughs> some philosopher. I didn't yeah, know I thought of all of these things. <laughs> it, it's really a difficult thing. I, I think the more and more we realize how interconnected we are, it's, it's hard to really ignore the conditions of other people in the rest of the world. And I'm writing that down because I think that interconnectedness is really a key right now. I've been trying to think of kind of what are some of the cultural uh, impacts of the of the pandemic and just working on being a leader for my team. And I, I want to work on some interconnectedness because we don't know what's all kind of affecting everyone. Oh, exactly. Uh, somebody said we may be all in the same ocean, but we're in different boats. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Good point. I know people say we're all in this together. I'm like, well, you don't really know that. We are in the big ocean, but there's definitely different viewpoints and different boats that get us there. I know you and I uh, both can work from home and at least from an economic job standpoint, there's really no difference. But then if you're a wait staff or a barber or a, you know somebody like that, this has had a huge impact on on their life. Just or if you were directly affected by um, by by the disease itself. Yep, exactly. Um, well, if it was uh, safe and affordable, uh, would you have any interest in taking a trip to space? Yes, I would. Uh, and what do you think it'd be like? I have no idea. But I feel like um, I would need some kind of briefing ahead of time. I do want to know about my destination. I like to research where I'm going. I don't just get on a, a train and go somewhere. Um, I like a little bit of explanation, exploration, but I'm also um, from a first world country. So there are some basic uh, comforts that, that I would enjoy. But part of this is 
even if it wasn't just like home, I would really want to see and experience it. But my reservation about space travel, it it always talks about travel too. It doesn't talk about a return and I would like a return because I'm not sure that I would take my whole family um, or could afford to take my whole family. So I don't know, I wouldn't want to not return to my family. I would be more interested in maybe uh, going into orbit around the earth, experiencing free fall and seeing uh, yes. the earth or, or maybe even to the moon for a week and come yeah. back. Yeah, exactly. And then be able to, to share that. But you don't see yourself immigrating to Mars. I don't. Um, I don't see myself immigrating to Mars. But I do think there might be people who would want to. Yeah, I'm a little skeptical of that. I because, you know, I think this pandemic uh, a lot of those same people that would be okay, said they would be okay with going to Mars. I don't know if they're okay in staying locked in their house for two months. So yeah. Imagine. <laughs> well, that's exactly. We didn't like staying lockdown for pandemic what's it going to be like going to some place like that exactly where you can't even go outside without donning a, a suit and yeah and I, i'm not a big fan of the cold so <laughs> that's well I, I really appreciate your time did you have any like uh, comments in closing yeah i'm curious um well i think this is great you're doing it i'd like to know what you're going to do with all this data um i probably will um I kind of see it as a time capsule. So if we do make it to the moon in 2024, and then we like look back from like 2030, 2040, this will provide like snapshots of what people were thinking as we were leading up to that moment. That's cool. And I was thinking it was also um, a good way to maybe create some summaries of different, you know, the range of views that are out there. You yes, can't... that's a good point. So uh, like some people have pointed out what you said about um, healthcare and food and uh, those types of things. But some other people also said something that was completely surprising uh, to me, and that was the thought of we shouldn't go to the moon because we might mess up the moon, which is... Uh, That's a good point, too. I hadn't thought about that, that environmental perspective. Did they invite us? You know, if the moon wanted us, wouldn't we be, you know, and who are us to decide that we're God and should go invading other places just because we've touched all the frontiers here and, and use their natural resources. I can see that argument. That's interesting. So um, have you written, going to write a blog? Have you do any of that? Do you stay up on Twitter? Um, I usually uh, just uh, post a message you say on Twitter, you know, we have this many days to end of 2024 and, you know, I interviewed so-and-so and, -so and uh, that, that's pretty much um, what okay. I, what I've done. But um Honestly, right now it's kind of like I, I have a 162 day streak with the interviews and oh, I'm, just, super. I'm just focused on trying to um, keep that going on a daily basis as sometimes it's hard to find somebody to interview. My, it is, it is. You can always probably find people on LinkedIn. Did you put Chad Schmidt on your list? I have not. I have to reach out to him. Chad Schmidt? Yes, I think I emailed you his name. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, you did. He's and the I person I'm mentoring that is trying to find a job as a new graduate, which is a little difficult. Yes, no, I reached out to him. I uh, tried to connect. I don't think he's accepted my invitation yet, but oh, okay. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that'd be good. The aerospace is actually uh, hiring like gangbusters. You know, SpaceX is uh, building the Starship in Brownsville, Texas. And wow. they're hiring um, all sorts of uh, people. And then um, Blue Origin, which is uh, Jeff Bezos's company, is hiring in like uh, Alabama and in Washington State and um, lots of people. Places. Oh, very cool then. I'll have to look at that. So. Super. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for have, having this chat with me. It's, it's exciting and I'm glad I could uh, provide a perspective to you. And it was really glad to meet you live. Same here. Okay. okay. Well, Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.